uh, very good evening to you all. I'm welcoming you to this webinar organized by the Spice Throat, uh, the Young Doctors Movement of South Asia. Uh, and uh, this is for the commemoration of the World AIDS Day, which was on the 1st of December this month. And uh, probably you know that Spice Root has organized a few webinars before, and this is one of the one of the webinars of that webinar series. And we had a webinar for the World Diabetes Day, uh, World Mental Health Day, and also for the World Youth Day. And now today we are commemorating the World AIDS Day, a very important day. And uh, among this pandemic of COVID-19, we are facing another pandemic of HIV and AIDS. And so these are very important time and very uh, timely, I think, moment um, uh, that the World AIDS Day to be commemorated. And just to rem remember and remind ourselves uh, how important to control HIV AIDS pandemic as well. Uh, so uh, today, the webinar is mainly arranged by the Spice Root Sri Lanka uh, with the help of all the other Spice Root movements. Um, so while welcoming you all for this webinar, uh, all the resource persons and all the attendees, I would like to uh, now invite Dr. Aruni uh, Wirakon, the Secretary of the Spice Rule Sri Lanka, to chair the session from this moment onwards and to conduct the session. Aruni, over to you. Thank you very much, Sankar. So as we all know, on the 1st of December, the world unites to commemorate the World AIDS Day and to show our support for people living with HIV and also to increase the awareness and to raise our voices to fight the epidemic. So this year's theme is global solidarity and shared responsibility. So as the young family doctors from South Asia showing our responsibility, let's unite to play our role. So though we are struggling as uh, Sanka mentioned with the pandemic, we simply can't the can't forget the epidemic that we have been fighting for the last nearly 30 years. So the Spice Road Sri Lanka is very much delighted to organize the event to mark the World AIDS Day on behalf of the South, uh, Spice Road South Asia. Of course, with the help of our partners from the region. The theme for the session today is ending the HIV AIDS epidemic, the role of primary care. So we have four eminent speakers joining us to share their experience and educate our colleagues and how, guide us on how to be responsible and take responsibility in controlling this epidemic. So let me introduce you our first speaker, Dr. Manjula Rajapaksha. Dr. Manjula Rajapaksa is a consultant venereologist at the District General Hospital, Kalutara. She qualified as a base uh, board certified consultant in venereology in the year 2013. And she completed her overseas specialized training at St. Mary's Hospital, London. And also she has held positions as the secretary and also vice president in the Sri Lanka College of Sexual Health and HIV Medicine. Over to you, Manjula. And she will be focusing on the achieved and the unachieved in controlling the epidemic. Over to you, Manjula. Uh, thank you very much, Aruni, for that nice introduction. And uh... you can share your slides, Manjula. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. 
sorry for that. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, Dr. Manjula, we can see your slides. Uh, can you put it to the presentation mode by just clicking uh, the button at the right downmost corner near the Zoom? Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that's okay now. Yes, yes, yes. Now it's clear. Yes. Okay. So good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you, Arun, for that uh, nice introduction. So today we are here and uh, my first presentation as the first presenter, I would like to talk to you about the HIV AIDS, the achieved and the unachieved. So as we all heard, uh, we are commemorating a nearly 40 year old uh, epidemic of HIV in the midst of uh, this newly born uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So in my presentation, I would like to uh, focus on the, the epidemiology, global, regional, and the local HIV AIDS epidemiology with the current HIV uh, AIDS trends and the National STD AIDS Control Program and its services, and what were the world targets and uh, what we have achieved and the challenges ahead. So we know that uh, the AIDS uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome came to the world in 1982 with uh, some uh, gay people in the US came with the very rare kind of opportunistic infections and cancers. Then it, uh, it initially uh, named as GRID, as gay-related uh, gay uh, immunodeficiency syndrome, but in 1982, since they discovered that many other populations also got this uh, same syndrome, it was defined as AIDS. And uh, one year later, the French and US, uh, US teams uh, find the causative agent that human immunodeficiency virus as the cause for this. So since then, so it HIV causing a very chronic infection, uh, impairing the human immunity with its viral activity and causing a symptomatic severe disease AIDS in its later, later stages. So now the world has uh, HIV also a pandemic. So uh, currently, according to the UN AIDS estimates, the 38 million people are affected living with HIV uh, at the moment. And you know, uh, Eastern and Southern Africa is at the most 7 million, but our region, Asia and Pacific also have the second highest 5.8 million. And the estimated number of adults and children newly infected with HIV in 2019 was also 1.7 million. And in our region, it's 300,000 new infections in 2019. What about the deaths, the AIDS-related deaths? So uh, 690,000 total HIV-related deaths were estimated in 2019 and 160,000 in our region. What about Sri Lanka? So actually, we are fortunate to be a low prevalent country yet, I'm saying yet, with the adults prevalence less than 0.1%. So current estimates for Sri Lanka, uh, the PLHIV, people living with HIV AIDS are 3,600, with estimated new infections in adults uh, in 2019 less than 200. But mind you that we have diagnosed uh, 439 people in 2019. And deaths, AIDS related deaths, estimated less than 200. And we had 43 people out of that 439 people died in 2019. Uh, what about the, the trends? The adults and children living with HIV globally, you know, the estimated numbers are going up gradually because added to the uh, the old infections, the new infections are adding, so the HIV is in rise. The new infections, the global new infection estimates and the, uh, the current new infections, we, the, globe, uh, the world has uh, reduced the HIV new infections by 40% since its peak in 1998. And the AIDS-related death uh, have been reduced by 60% since the peak in 2004. When we see the distribution of HIV infections by population globally, uh, we will see the key populations, what we call the gay men who are MSMs, the men who have sex with men, sex workers and their clients, transgender people and people who inject drugs account for 
62% of new infections globally. And when we uh, come to our region, it's interesting that 98% of these new infections are happening among these key populations. So what about the trends in Sri Lanka? So uh, in Sri Lanka, if we take the, the reported HIV infections, HIV diagnosis, you can see it's in the, in the rise and from kind of 2016 onwards, the rise is kind of, uh, there is a rapid rise, not a very gradual rise. And also you can notice the rise is more, the HIV infections are diagnosed more in males. So compared to 2011, we have 460% increase in men who have uh, infected with HIV, which is kind of alarming in Sri Lanka, while the females remaining at a uh, kind of 20% stable level. So when we see uh, the probable mode of transmission, we can see why these men are uh, getting more infected because uh, you can see that the light blue uh, column in 19, uh, 2019, 46% of people got HIV infection due to the male-to-male -male transmission. So when we see the diagnosed HIV people, we can see the increase gradually uh, from a heterosexually driven HIV epidemic in Sri Lanka to uh, a homosexually driven, MSM driven epidemic again in Sri Lanka going with the global trend. So we have the AIDS epidemic uh, module. We have postulated according to the uh, available data. So this trend will be continuing uh, if we will, if we not, if we are not to uh, interfere with our interventions. And also, so as I told you, the estimated new infections uh, are to be in a uh, decline according to the estimates, but. We are uh, repeatedly the new uh, the new diagnosis, not the new infection, the new diagnosis. I may say, because it involves the new and the old old uh, infections as well. So it's in the rise. So what is the reason for this? So when we take the CD4 level, that is the uh, immunity. So HIV virus affect the CD4 lymphocytes. And if the CD4 lymphocytes are less than 200, we say the patients are in the AIDS stage. So severe immunodeficiency. So out of the people, nearly 30%, 32% in 2019 were in AIDS stage. And so if the CD4 count is less than 350, we say those people are also in late stage. So we can see nearly 54% of people who are newly diagnosed with HIV were in the late stage. So we are diagnosing uh, the people at 50%, nearly 50% of people at late stages. So then we move to what is the, uh, who is giving the response to the STI as well as the HIV. So the National STD AIDS Control Program, Sri Lanka is responsible for the national response for HIV as well as STI. So we were fortunate to have uh, HIV services uh, incorporated into our existing STI services, even from the, uh, before our first patient was diagnosed in Sri Lanka. So we are responsible for the preventive services as well as the treatment services, and also the monitoring and uh, evaluation part happening in related to STIs and HIV. So mainly, the preventive services. So you, you understood that the, the more infections are happening in this key population. So NSACP also targets these preventive services mainly for the uh, key population. So there are uh, many uh, community-based organizations and uh, uh, non-governmental organizations who support the NSACP in this uh, reaching these uh, key populations, because you know that the key populations are not always visible. They are a kind of a hidden population. So the uh, HIV STI prevention package with the uh, education and communication, condom promotion and information and HIV testing, referring to the uh, HIV clinics, all happening with the support of the peer educators in the CBOs. And also we perform the rapid HIV testing for the KPs when they come to the uh, STI clinics as well as as outreach programs. So to cater these key populations, we conduct evening clinics, outreach clinics, and also prison 
inmates also identified as a key population in Sri Lanka. So prison HIV services happening. And with all these, you know that these key populations are belong to a hidden, uh, who are with the kind of illegal behavior, which is not accepted culturally or legally. So we have to do many things about create the enabling environment with, uh, with legal and societal uh, facilitation as well. So the other general population and the vulnerable youth also we have conduct many preventive uh, programs uh, through uh, using the technology also as well, uh, because the young people who access the technology are like to uh, access the services through that. And also uh, preventing mother to child transmission of HIV and STI also a main component of NSACP and training and capacity building of health and non-health uh, staff is also uh, done with the NSACP preventive package. So the awareness, the, the traditional awareness campaigns are now combined with testing because we know that testing promotes the linking to the care. So the diagnostic and treatment services is the other part of NSACP. So NSACP uh, has 41 uh, peripheral clinics uh, distributed all over the island. So give these, uh, these clinics supports the, uh, all the diagnosis and management of STIs as well as HIV. So, and the HIV diagnostic services are now expanded to other health services like the hospitals from the base hospital upwards levels and to the community MOH and also uh, to the general practitioners as well, especially in Colombo and Gampaha district. So they give, diagnose and treat. So we give the uh, NSACP and the other clinics support the diagnosis and the management of STI as well as HIV. So we are giving antiretroviral treatment, the uh, effective uh, HIV treatment for the people given for free by the government of Sri Lanka. And also the counseling services and uh, the other counseling uh, services for the STI and HIV and also other mental health issues are also handled and referred by the NSACP. And other important aspect is provision of post-exposure prophylaxis, mainly for the occupational exposures after needle stick injuries to the healthcare workers, as well as non-occupational exposure also uh, happening in the uh, NSACP clinics. The pre-exposure prophylaxis also uh, uh, kind of a new approach to prevent HIV, that is giving a, a, a H ART before the exposure happens. So I'm not going to talk about that because uh, Mahesh will talk later. So all these are uh, happening in, S, uh, in SACP diagnostic services. So monitoring and evaluation part is also a very important component of a, a preventive and curative service. So we have our strategic information and management unit, which gathers all the information and dissemination is uh, taking place. Uh, and also uh, uh, in uh, from 2017 upwards, we have been planning to do the electronic information management system. So I'm proud to say that uh, now many clinics are managing the uh, uh, STI and HIV management through this electronic uh, management system, a paperless system. So when we go for the targets, the globe, uh, the world has the targets of ending AIDS by 2030, which was uh, started in 2015. So thinking the fast track uh, targets for, for ending AIDS in 2030 was to reduce infections fewer than 500,000 by 2020 to reduce AIDS related deaths fewer than 500,000 by 2020 and also to eliminate HIV related stigma and discrimination because that is very important in achieving the HIV related goals. So to have achieved this goal, the world set the 90-90-90 targets. That is the 90% of people who are infected with HIV should aware of their status out of which 90% should be linked to care and on effective HIV treatment, and also out of which 90% should be fully virally suppressed with undetectable viral load. So this will cause uh, the 30 million people on treatment by 2030 and fewer than 500,000 new infections happen annually. So have we achieved the targets? So if we take uh, from 2000 to 2019, uh, the HIV new infections. So the world has uh, 
able to reduce the percentage change as 23%. So we have reduced the new HIV infections by 23%, but you can see we have not achieved the target. So the target is there with the blue dot and uh, there is a, a, a long way to achieve the target. And AIDS related deaths also the same. So we have not yet achieved the target, even though we have reduced the HIV uh, related deaths. And what about the progress of these 90-90-90 targets? So by end of 2019, the first 90, so we only achieved 81% and then 82% and so 88% who were engaged with care and only 50 ART were virally suppressed. What about uh, the regional values? No region was able to achieve it uh, to the 90-90-90 level. And now region Asia and Pacific so it's 75% people knew that they were uh, uh, their HIV status and out of which 80 engaged in KR and non-ART and 91% were fully suppressed. What about Sri Lanka? So our first 90, only 64% of people knew their HIV status by 2000, end of 2019, out of which 80% were linked to KR and on started on effective treatment, 86% were fully virally suppressed. So you can see nowhere in the world we could achieve these targets, the 1990 targets, because we are nearly finishing 2020. So the world did not achieve what we expected, even though we achieved something. So what are the reasons of this for this? So the, uh, as you can see, the first 90 was the, the major challenge. We could not achieve this global targets. So there were patient-led factors and the physician-led factors uh, leading to this. So mainly the people, the lack of their knowledge about the HIV and also the risk of HIV and uh, about stigma and discrimination, whether they, they will be stigmatized if they come to care and lack of access for testing services in some regions and the cost of testing if it is not available for free and also the thinking about the confidentiality. And that there were many physician related factors. So mainly what we see is the lack of updated knowledge about HIV because not considering HIV as a differential diagnosis we're seeing among the physicians. So when everything becomes negative only the physicians thinks can this be HIV? And also, especially in the uh, kind of uh, general practitioner setup, family setup. So fears causing stigma and uh, discrimination to the people because the general practitioners, family physicians are so close to the uh, families and they might think that it will cause offering the test will cause a stigma. And also not comfortable uh, taking this sexual history and discussing this uh, risk assessment. And also fear of losing the faith by the patient and lack of enough time to discuss in the BC OPD setups and the BC words. And also sometimes a simple negligence, not thinking about HIV or uh, a kind of a negligence had also been seen as a reason. So to achieve 1990 targets, we have to say that we need to test more and also linking is also important. They link all tested positives for HIV care. So what we have actually achieved, so we have achieved something. So we, we have, we had a progress of this 1990 uh, targets and you can see from uh, 2017, the, the uh, testing has been increased and also the pregnant women, HIV testing among pregnant women, it was a kind of a selective testing in the beginning, but it was started universal testing. And now all the pregnant women were tested for HIV as well as syphilis and uh, so with the, that achievement, actually, uh, you may have heard that we have uh, got the elimination of uh, mother to child transmission uh, of HIV and syphilis in Sri Lanka by WHO in 2019, the third country in the uh, Southeast Asia after Thailand and Malaysia. So we were successful in getting eliminating mother to child transmission of HIV in Sri Lanka. And also we have reached uh, key population, even though we could not achieve 100% uh, coverage reaching targets, but we have reached our key populations, the female sex workers, MSMs, beach boys, and uh, people who inject drugs and also uh, transgender people. So these were some 
achievements. And also HIV testing, we have expanded. I told you the antenatal mothers and the blood donors, we do the universal testing. And also you can see uh, HIV rapid tests were introduced to the hospitals uh, from 2018, and we got a good yield. You can see after the highest yield HIV positivity rate was from that rapid HIV test done in the hospitals. So there are many challenges ahead. So in addition to the challenges we already face, this COVID-19 pandemic has put the world even further behind its efforts to end uh, AIDS by 2030. But we can make a crisis and an opportunity. So in these difficult periods, the communities were now better recognized for their leadership and their innovative methods. So we have to live in this near normal life for coming years. So we, this can serve as a platform for future success. So if uh, from the lessons we learned from this COVID pandemic and also the HIV epidemic, uh, the HIV response, the AIDS response, can recover quickly. So the COVID-19 restrictions actually accelerated the innovations in HIV service delivery because we were, the, uh, the world is engaged in community-led services where the communities, uh, the PLHIV organizations and the community-based organizations were supporting in many ways, the testing people, uh, delivering their medication, that kind of uh, support and also use of new technology uh, using the, some apps. So we use the Know For Sure app from the NSACP to test uh, the youths to, who are uh, using the technology and also introducing the HIV self-testing we will be introducing very soon. And also multi-month dispensing of antiretroidal drugs. So people used to come monthly to collect their HIV medication, but in this pandemic, we were dispensing multi-month, actually three to four months drugs for the patient. So these all innovations were happening because of this COVID crisis. So UNAIDS uh, set 2025 targets to achieve this uh, uh, ending AIDS by 2030. So rather than sticking into 90, uh, 90 so we are going for 95. So uh, the important thing is they are putting the people living with HIV and the communities at risk of HIV at the center. So by 2025, so we have to achieve 95% of PLHIV should know their status. Out of them, 95% should be on effective treatment and 95% of them should be virally suppressed. And also 95% of mothers should have the uh, services for eliminating the vertical transmission. And also 95% of people, women have reproductive and sexual health services. So with this, so the coll collective global efforts that prioritize people can uh, surely transform this COVID-19 crisis into an opportunity to accelerate the HIV response and get back to, back to ending AIDS by 2030. So that's why we set uh, the theme of World AIDS Day 2020 as a global solidarity and shared responsibility because it's not, no country in the world could be able to eliminate HIV or uh, COVID alone. So it's a global uh, responsibility and global solidarity. So we will be, uh, uh, we can end AIDS by 2030. It's not an impossible target, it's a possible target, but it requires more commitment, courage, and compassion. So with that, uh, I would like to conclude my presentation. So I think everybody, so the young general practitioners, family practitioners will join us uh, to our target in ending AIDS. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Manjula, for that very comprehensive, uh, timely presentation and also summarizing a uh, 40 years long uh, pan epidemic into a nutshell and highlighting what we have achieved and what to be achieved and also the, highlighting the lapses on our part as doctors. And just to clarify once again, Manjula, so you mentioned uh, nearly 50% or more than 50% of HIV are diagnosed at a late stage, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah. yes. Yeah, so it highlights as the uh, frontline uh, doctors in the health system the, and as primary care doctors in the region, the role and the responsibility that we have to take in combating this epidemic. So yeah, thank you very much, Manjula. Now I would like okay. to move to the next speaker. 
we have Dr. Mahesh Ratnayaka, uh, a senior consultant in sex, uh, senior consultant sexual health physician at Adelaide Sexual Health Center and Infectious Disease Outpatient Clinic, the Department of Internal Medicine, Royal Adelaide Hospital, Australia. Uh, Dr. Mahesh actually started his uh, training as a in venereology in Sri Lanka and he completed the MD program and then migrated to Australia. And now he's a very eminent clinician there. And we are much privileged to have you today for our session, Dr. Mahesh. And over to you, Dr. Mahesh, and he will be speaking on novel approaches for prevention and treatment of HIV. Over to you, Mahesh. Um. Thank you so much. Um, let me see how I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Uh, no, Dr. Okay. Mahesh, not yet. Okay. There's a green button uh, at the bottom of the screen uh, saying yes. share screen with an arrow. Just give me a second. I think there is a problem in sharing the screening. Uh, till Mahesh is getting on with the slides, I would like to remind the audience if they do have any questions, they can uh, post in the chat box or uh, we, we can, you can ask at the end of the session from the speakers. Just give me a sec, sorry. Something to do with screen recording. Is it okay now? Yes, we can see. You can uh, put it onto the uh, PowerPoint yes, mode. Right. All right, thank you. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so thank you so much for uh, the kind, in kind introduction. And today I'm gonna to talk about um, novel approaches for prevention of um, prevention and treatment of HIV. Um, so I'll try to uh, talk briefly about few topics. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask at the end of the uh, presentation. And uh, firstly, um, I'm going to do uh, give a brief uh, 
on um, the topics that I'm gonna cover today. Uh, the first topic is um, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, and then post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, and few things on new treatment options, and uh, a bit on treatment as prevention, and accelerated initiation of ART. So let's talk about uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. Um, so PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis prevents HIV through sex and RV drug use. So um, I hope everyone knows about PrEP and um, <clears throat> how it works, sorry. Um, the efficacy of PrEP has been proved by several studies done throughout the world. And PrEP can be taken either daily or on demand. So daily PrEP is about 99% effective and multiple studies have also proven that daily PrEP works. And people can take on demand PrEP, which is taking PrEP only when you need it. And it is 97% effective uh, with the original IPAGES study. Uh, so IPAGES study uh, later did an open label uh, extension that showed uh, it was about 97% effective. And there is another trial going on in France, which is called Prevena study, and uh, which has proven none of the people who are taking on demand PREC were positive if they were taking it properly. So we, we, we take uh, on-demand PrEP as effective as daily PrEP. And PrEP works at population level as well. So New South Wales um, Health Department uh, released a me did a media release uh, recently, and uh, they rolled out their PrEP program in March 2016. And they saw their incidence of HIV drop by one third after 12 months. And Alfred Health in Victoria also did a press release. Um, um, they saw um, their HIV incidence drop from 28, 28 in 2099 to 16 in 2017 which was about 43% decline. And their HIV testing rates were increased by 203% during uh, 2017. But yet there was 43% decline in the incidence. So it works at population level. So few things about PrEP guidelines and the eligibility criteria. And Australian national guidelines uh, have uh, their own eligibility criteria for PrEP. So this is um, assessing uh, the patient's uh, risk during the last three months, as well as future risks. So uh, it could be you have a HIV positive partner who is not on treatment or still have a viral load if they are on treatment, doesn't matter. And if the patient has had any unprotected anal sex with, a, with one, more, one or more casual partners during the last three months, or if they have been diagnosed with rectal gonorrhea, rectal chlamydia, or infectious during, syphilis during the last three months, or if they have had chem sex during the last three months, or if there have been condom accidents. And then the recommendations extend for the next three months as well. And you don't have to have had any uh, increased risk, risky behaviors during the last three months. One can say, I would like you to have unprotected sex with casual male partners in next uh, few weeks and the person is eligible for PrEP. And um, so you can read, there are several options uh, uh, um, or several risks identified by the ASHM uh, to recommend PrEP. And this is just sexual transmission only. 
And ASHAM also recommends uh, PrEP for IV drug users if they share needles. And this is WHO guidelines. Um, the WHO guidelines uh, look at the history over the last six months and the person should be HIV negative and uh, maybe the person has a sexual partner who's HIV positive and not viral suppressed or the person is sexually active in high incidence, HIV incident prevalence population and having uh, this, these risk factors. But remember, before starting PrEP, we have to exclude active HIV infection on the person. And his renal functions should be good. Um, creatine clearance should be more than 60. And if someone has signs and symptoms of acute HIV infection, we would not start him uh, or the person on PrEP. So PrEP is with tinofovir, dupoxyl fumarate, and emprisidibane, 200 milligrams, is a, as a combined tablet, uh, taken daily or when they need it. So I'm gonna talk about how to take daily PrEP initially. So there are recommendations to how, as to how to start and stop in daily PrEP for different patient groups. So for men who have sex with men, they can start daily PrEP with a daily tablet for seven days before they have unprotected sex. Or they can take two tablets as a stat dose and it's work, it works after two hours. And then you take one a day as long as you need. And whenever you want to stop PrEP, you take a dose 24 hours and 48 hours after the last sexual exposure. That's pretty much it. And all the other patient groups, population groups, including women, they have to take one tablet a day for seven days before it starts working. And then they take one a day as long as they want. And then they can stop the tablet uh, after extending it for 20 days after last six. But the important thing is the adherence. So adherence is really important uh, for daily prep to become successful. So you need to take at least four doses per week uh, to get successful results. And taking on-demand prep is so easy. People can take two tablets between two to 24 hours before having sex and they have sex then. And then they take one tablet 24 hours and one other tablet 48 hours after having sex. And basically they take four tablets at each episode of sex. This is so easy. So a bit about monitoring of PrEP. It's really important that people have a HIV test initially and not start in PrEP unt uh, until they get a negative HIV test. So depending on the previous sex behaviors, sexual behaviors, even though you start PrEP, you might still need to have a repeat HIV test in six weeks time. And you need to assess side effects each and every time. Hepatitis B testing has to be done initially because uh, tinofovir and emtricitabine are both active against hepatitis B. So if you start uh, uh, someone on uh, tinofovir and emtricitabine uh, with hepatitis B, the people, uh, patients can get uh, severe um, hepatic flare-ups uh, once you stop uh, daily PrEP. So it's really important that you exclude hepatitis B before starting PrEP therefore. So hepatitis C testing has to be done initially as well as uh, every 12 monthly for people who are on PrEP. And basically, <clears throat> it's quite understandably, you need to uh, do STI testing on these people every three monthly and EGFR uh, has to be done initially. And in three months, 
and they are after every six monthly. So a bit of an explanation uh, as to why we should EG, do EG fast is because um, tenofovir, dipoxyl fumarate, can cause a kidney impairment in about one to 2% of the population. And urine protein creatinine ratio is done for the same reason to monitor kidney functions because um, you will see uh, patients leak excessive amounts of proteins uh, if the kidneys are getting affected. And obviously uh, you need to exclude pregnancy in females. So basically people come um, every three monthly, they get their STI testing, syphilis testing, HIV testing, and they get a script for three months. And, um, and people actually follow uh, their uh, sort of proposed uh, follow-up plan. It's really good to see them coming uh, every three months for testing and to correct the scripts. And a uh, few new developments on PrEP. Um, as I said before, either you have to take it daily or when you need it. But um, there, was, there is a phase three trial ongoing for long acting injectable cabotegravir, which is an integrase inhibitor, um, which can be given every two monthly uh, if the trial is successful. And there is another phase trial, phase one trial uh, presented in uh, International AIDS Society conference last year. And they did study uh, something called Islatravir, which is a nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor. Um, which uh, they did study for 12 weeks, but the mathematical modeling showed that the implant can, uh, subdermal implant can last for about 12 months. And it's amazing to see that uh, you could uh, put an implant and it works for 12 months for PrEP. It's much better than contraceptives. And post-exposure prophylaxis is not a new topic at all, but I thought, uh, as uh, GPs and uh, people who uh, provide primary care, care for people. Um, I think it's uh, good to know a bit, about, uh, a bit more about PrEP as well. Um, so PrEP is, so PEP is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis is 81% uh, effective in preventing HIV, but it has to be taken within the first 72 hours. And the duration of uh, prophylaxis is 28 days. So um, PrEP, sorry, it should be PEP. PEP can be uh, prescribed following uh, sexual exposures, needle stick injuries, uh, or shared needles and other injecting equipment. So PEP prevents HIV in all these situations. So this is um, um, Australian guidelines uh, uh, on uh, PEP recommendation. When someone has an exposure, to a person with unknown HIV status. So uh, just uh, ignore the estimate uh, risk of HIV transmission for exposure because that risk is calculated uh, with the Australian uh, uh, data. So that's not very relevant, but um, you can see uh, receptive alien intercourse. Uh, if the partner's HIV status is unknown, we give two drugs, shared needles, two drugs, um, insertive anal intercourse, two drugs, and vaginal intercourse is less risky because uh, the prevalence of HIV in Australia is less than one in thousand. So it's probably the same for Sri Lanka as well. So um, we generally don't recommend uh, PEP. And oral intercourse is, is the next important thing. There is absolutely no risk of uh, transmitting HIV uh, through oral sex unless the person has a big sore on the penis or in the mouth. Um, so we don't generally recommend uh, PEP uh, following oral intercourse. And mucous membrane and non-intact skin exposures uh, also, unless uh, the uh, source person is high risk of having HIV, we don't recommend it. And community needle stick injuries, not in the healthcare setup. Sometimes people come with uh, needle, needle stick injuries occurring um, that have occurred in the community. So discarded needles in the streets and so on. So we don't recommend uh, PEP for those situations. So when the partner is known HIV positive, the situation is totally different. But 
you have some uh, sort of new uh, sort of concept u equals u which is if the person is undetectable which means if the person is on treatment and having an undetectable viral load that person cannot transmit the infection to someone else through sex so therefore if the partner the person had sex is hi positive and on treatment with undetectable viral load we don't recommend post exposure prophylaxis but if the source person is hiv positive unknown and treatment status or viral load is not known then we always recommend three drugs but even so you can see uh, we still don't recommend pep for oral sex unless the receiving partner had a big so in the mouth but thankfully who has made this very simple basically uh, if someone is eligible for pep uh, the person is going to get three drugs um, so what they say is uh, they they acknowledge uh, two drugs are effective but uh, they they recommend three drugs for people which is straightforward and us cdc guidelines follow the same thing so this is very straightforward the australian system is bit complicated as usual um so what medications can we give so basically we have uh, the uh, antiretroviral therapy backbone so you have uh, tenofovir lamivudine uh, as the backbone uh, so if you are giving two drugs you can give either tenofovir lamivudine or tenofovir imprescindibine as uh, um, the two drug option and cytovudine and lamivudine um, was an option in the past but uh, even who doesn't recommend it for adults these days because of uh, side effects with headaches diarrhea and anemia so um, it's not a preferred option anymore so third drug could be um, lopinavir ritonavir which is uh, the preferred uh, uh, option with who and uh, who also recommend uh, atsenavir ritonavir darunavir ritonavir and raltegravir Uh, Australian guidelines recommend dolutegravir and rilpurine as well. So that that's post exposure prophylaxis. And uh, let's talk about new, new treatment options. Um, really sorry, this is going to be a little bit technical, uh, too technical probably. But anyway, so basically we have uh, combined uh, uh, sing, co sort of single tablets. with multiple medications uh, um, you take as a single tablet a day so um, we have abacavir lamivudine and dolutegravir which is not very new comes as triumec and then we have um, tenofovir alfenamide uh, emprisantabine and elvitegravir with the booster uh, cobicistat as genvoya that's not very new either um then we had the old version of genvoya with uh, tenofovir difoxyl fumarate and not, it's nothing new either um we have odepsy which is uh, tenofovir alfenamide emprisantabine and rilpivirine and then eviplera with uh, tenofovir difoxyl fumarate uh, emprisantabine and rilpivirine and so the newest one is victavi uh, which is tenofovir alfenamide emprisantabine and bictegravir and then uh, simtosa which is uh, taf emprisantabine and darunavir cobicistat then uh, we have delstrigoy which is uh, tdf ftc 3tc and dorivirin so um, basically all these are um, three medications uh, coming as single tablets so um, as you know uh, for hiv the uh, conventional uh, treatment is with three medications triple therapy that's why we say heart highly active antiretroviral antiretroviral therapy so these are the options uh, we have at this stage the latest options including um, 
treatment options which were available within the last, I would say, six, seven years. This is all triple therapy. Now we have uh, uh, um, two drug combinations. Um, we have Descovi with tenofovir alfanamide and uh, imprecitabine, which is uh, a backbone. Then you have to add another medication to that to make it triple therapy. And atosinavir cobicistat is a protease inhibitor. So that is uh, the third drug. You need to have a backbone with uh, tenofovir or abacavir with lamivudine or imprecitabine. And darunavir is also protease inhibitor, the booster is cobicista, then you have a backbone, then you have to add uh, darunavir cobicista to that. Then we have brand new options, uh, dolutegravir and rilpivirine coming as Jaluka. And then we have dolutegravir lamiudine coming as Dovato. But the interesting thing about these two medications, Jaluka and Dovato, they can be used as dual therapy. So instead of uh, taking three, tab three medications, the patients have an option of taking uh, uh, two medication, but still as a single tablet, but they can take two medications these days. That's one of the latest developments in HIV treatment. But there are a few caveats. Um, so let's go to dual therapy options. So Dovato, that is dolutegravir and lamiudine, you can take uh, uh, one tablet a day, a single tablet, but uh, the viral load should be less than 500 copies per milliliter, 500,000 copies per milliliter, sorry. And there shouldn't be um, hepatitis B or any drug resistance to dolutegravir or lamivudine before we can give Dovato. And the next dual therapy option is Jaloka, which is dolutegravir and ripurin. And um, so there are some problems with ripurin have to take it with food, then you can't take any PPIs due to drug interactions, and there shouldn't be any uh, uh, resistance to uh, uh, either dolutegravir or rilpivirin. But um, if all these are, are sort of fulfilled, um, then uh, people can go on Jaluk as a single tablet. And another dual therapy, which is an injectable, uh, which is likely to come in uh, to the market within the next couple of years is cabotegravir and ripivirin as an intramuscular injection, which can be taken monthly or two monthly. So this is very interesting um, because uh, some of my patients are very keen uh, to not to take a tablet daily because that reminds them of their HIV every time they take the tablet. So um, I think uh, this population will be benefited by uh, injectables. But um, as you'd understand, most people don't like injections and uh, there were some uh, uh, injection site reactions, uh, which is probably a bit of a drawback uh, in injectables, but um, some people will, will welcome this uh, greatly. Um, and the next topic is treatment as prevention. So uh, this is very interesting. Um, the ASHAM, which is the um, Australasian Sexual Health, uh, sorry, Australasian HIV, um, Viral Hepatitis and Sexual Health Medicine uh, Society guidelines. Um, they did uh, issue this uh, uh, recommendation uh, endorsing um, undetectable equals untransmissible, U equals U. What this says is if someone has undetectable viral load while on treatment, he is practically will not be passing the infection to someone else by having sex. So there is evidence since, uh, there has been evidence since year 2016 that a durable HIV viral suppression, less than 200 copies per milliliter, will stop the sexual transmission of HIV. So there is no ambiguity in this recommendation, uh, which is U equals U. There's no may or will or whatever. It's U equals U, or it's a very strong message um, that will change people's life uh, who are infected with HIV. But this is only for sexual transmission. There's not enough evidence uh, for uh, transmission, through, transmission through blood or breastfeeding at this stage. So um, 
I think we might get some uh, more information as we go on. So what mean what does mean undetectable? And um, so different areas and different countries of the world, they will have different definitions on what is undetectable while load for them. And in my practice, uh, undetectable for me is less than 20 copies per milliliter, or even less than 10 is undetectable. So if it is less than 10, the lab will say undetectable. Between 10 to 20, it would say um, detectable less than 20. But if it is more than 20, the lab will give us an actual number. But it could be 50, it could be 200, depending on where you practice. But if the viral load is less than 200, and if the person is on treatment, and if there's good adherence, you can safely say U, U equals U. So with the current treatment options, especially with integrase inhibitors, your viral load is, patient's viral load is likely to be dropping to zero by, I would say six weeks. So once it drops to zero, if you do two uh, viral loads between uh, a four week period and if both are undetectable and if you have a confidence that the patient is taking the treatment, um, it's safe to say U equals U. And more conservatively, um, the, 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 the Theory has been, it has to be six months undetectable before uh, we give the green light to have unprotected sex. But uh, with the new uh, recommendation, uh, all you need is uh, good, good adherence and uh, two uh, negative viral loads over four weeks. So what are the benefits of uh, this concept? Obviously you would understand it will uh, diminish uh, the stigma associated with HIV and sort of, um, to reduce the barriers for HIV testing and treatment and improve self-esteem and um, supports the healthy sex life of these people and reduces sex partners concerned and they can have children safely. So there are a lot of uh, benefits of uh, this concept. And, um, but the problem is if the patient stops taking HIV medications, the viral rebound can happen within one to two weeks and they can possibly transmit the infection to their partner. So that's that's really important uh, uh, concept or it's an important message uh, because uh, if the people don't uh, be sort of, if they are not genuine in what they are saying to the health uh, professional, uh, the things can go wrong. So U equals U is good, but there are a few caveats. And there is, this concept of accelerated ART initiation uh, endorsed by WHO uh, since 2017 from top of my head, um, because uh, delays in starting ART uh, can be sort of uh, uh, very disadvantageous for people uh, who are co-infected with HIV, or if they have uh, acute HIV zero conversion or advanced immunosuppression. So, um, so as, as well as there's um, uh, emerging evidence that uh, ART, uh, starting ART as soon as possible uh, improves clinical and program outcomes as well. So um, why, what are the benefits of uh, uh, starting uh, treatment as soon as possible? One is of course, the clinical benefit to the patient, all right? So if they are zero converting or if they have advanced HIV, as Manjula said, uh, if it is closer to 200, that they might be reaching AIDS. So that's for their personal benefit. So ART uh, will, uh, rapid ART will reduce the viral load and uh, in gradually increases the uh, CD4 counts. And that's, uh, there's a clinical benefit to the patient. And what is the benefit to the society? So people, these people will drop their viral load as, as soon as possible and they become uh, HIV non-infectious. So um, I also start uh, same day, do same day uh, uh, initiation sometimes um, if they are uh, sort of acutely zero converting or with the sexual history, if the patient tells me that, um, you know, he has had sex with 10 people in the last three months, I would start the patient treatment on the same day because of the public health benefits. And um, so the WHO recommendation is um, rapid ART initiation should be offered to all people living with HIV following a confirmed HIV diagnosis and clinical assessment. 
and same day initiation should be offered to people who are ready to start treatment on the day. But again, then there are a few uh, limitations. Um, patients should undergo history and clinical examination to evaluate uh, for significant opportunistic infection, especially for tuberculosis and cryptococcal meningitis. So we need to assess patient clinically for signs and symptoms of TB and cryptococcal meningitis or any other significant opportunistic infection. So in that situations, we will defer treatment. You order CD4 count on the day, but you don't need to wait for CD4 results uh, before you could start treatment. And um, if there are clinical signs or symptoms of TB, then obviously you have a different treatment and assess symptoms and try and diagnose TB or exclude TB. If the TB is diagnosed, the recommendation is you start uh, anti-TB treatment as soon as possible and uh, start uh, HIV treatment within the first eight weeks. But if the CD4 count is less than 50, uh, you need to start treatment uh, uh, earlier than that because there is high mortality uh, if you don't start HIV treatment um, as soon as possible. And um, if serum crypt cryptococcal antigen is positive, uh, I would still delay in treatment because uh, they can have cryptococcal meningitis. And uh, with treatment, you can get uh, immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome, which can increase uh, in uh, intracranial pressure and cause complications. So people who have uh, positive cryptococcal antigen should have lumbar punctures. And if they are diagnosed with uh, cryptococcal meningitis, then uh, ART should be delayed uh, depending on the treatment regimen. Could be up to about four, four, uh, four months, two months, it could be more. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Otherwise, um, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, listening to me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahesh, for giving uh, enlightening us on the the most latest prevention and treatment options, and also emphasizing how effective the current uh, new uh, treatment available and how it can help in uh, propag in the propagation of the epidemic. And uh, if you have questions, you can post into the chat box and the panelist is. Uh, I would like to request from the panelist also, since we are running behind time, to reply the queries uh, in the chat boxes so that it will uh, save time. Now, next we have our, uh, as our resource person for the today's session is Dr. Uh, Bidyu uh, Banerjee, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. He's a senior registrar in the Department of Family Medicine, Artemis Hospital, uh, Haryana, India. And we also have uh, Dr. Ramakrishna Prasad as the moderator. Dr. Ramakrishna is a consultant at HIV in primary care and he's board certified in family medicine in USA with expertise in infectious disease. In addition to the residence in family medicine, he holds a master's in public health, infectious disease and microbiology, and also fellowships in HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, and faculty development in family medicine from the University of Pittsburgh. <clears throat> Besides significant faculty and leadership level experiences in the USA and India, he has also worked in other countries such as West Indies and uh, Southern Africa. So now this session is going to be based on his presentations. So it's going to be lessons from patients. And over to you, Dr. Binaji. Uh -huh. Are my slides visible? Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Dr. Banerjee, yes. we can, yes, we can see. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much for the warm introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank AFPI and Spice Group for giving me this opportunity. So good evening, one and all. Um, it's a rather cold evening here in Haryana. 
uh, Gurgaon in India. And uh, I, Dr. Vidyut Banerjee, would be discussing about a, a rather hot topic. HIV in India, reached and unreached. Uh, where do we stand as of now and uh, where we ought to be? So uh, I have these objectives for today's uh, program. Uh, we'll uh, discuss uh, India's position in terms of HIV targets, share a real life case scenario from our hospital and uh, using that highlight the importance of primary care physician in HIV care. Um, So uh, the fast track targets have already been uh, explained by my previous uh, speakers very well. Uh, we have now moved to the 95, 95, 95 target. And uh, what do our numbers say? So uh, overall India's pandemic is slowing down. If we were to see the prevalence uh, of adult HIV, uh, at, it stands at roughly 0.22%. But uh, yet with a population as huge as ours, we are actually uh, referring to a sizable number of 2.3 million people living with HIV AIDS. Uh, we have had close to 59,000 AIDS related deaths in the year 2019, which amounts to a decline of roughly 66% uh, uh, decrease from 2010. Uh, so where do we stand in the 95, 95, 95 target? Uh, that's there on the screen right now. 76% aware of their status of which 83% on HIV treatment, which is a substantial improvement if we were to consider 36% ART coverage in 2013, or even 56% ART coverage in the year 2017. And 33% of uh, these people are widely suppressed. So um, this is what I'm talking about exactly in numbers from the recent uh, India HIV estimates of 2019. Well, uh, looking at this, um, this sounds all nice and sweet. Doesn't it? Are we are we really happy with this? Let's see. Um, if we look at the graph left top corner, yes, the numbers have declined, but then still the challenges are plenty. Uh, we have 65% of HIV infections uh, and 78% of people living with HIV in India uh, as of 2019 from 10 major states. And only because few states like Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, especially Karnataka, have done a brilliant job, do we see the change in the national trends? So what we see as national uh, numbers do not exactly translate to progress of all the states. Uh, we are home to almost 24% of the global multi-drug resistant and rifampin resistant TB burden. That said, only 42% of those eligible for isoniazid prevention therapy were receiving it as of 2019. 58% of people with HIV-associated TB were not reported to have reached the TB care. We need uh, more insights. There are data inadequacies uh, on key population size estimates at a district level. For example, migrant workers who are essentially forming a bridge of pop, uh, bridge population between groups that are at high risk uh, and those at low risk of HIV infection. And yet we do not have much information about their sexual practices. Stigma and discrimination, uh, if we were to go about the 2016 study, one third of adults demonstrated discrimination, uh, discriminatory attitudes towards people with HIV. Uh, this is even common in the medical fraternity, though is it, uh, this is really saddening to hear, but a substantial majority uh, of those infected with HIV when uh, questioned said that uh, many healthcare staff had this attitude that they got what they deserved. 
which is a really sorry state of affairs. <clears throat> now, stigma and discrimination, be it faced by sex workers, transgenders, or even men who have sex with men, um, it would obviously discourage people from attending clinics and health facilities, leading to suboptimal adherence and delays in getting prescriptions refilled. Um, thereby, uh, thereby, this would uh, interfere with the viral suppression. Condom usage, although is uh, in acceptable ranges in the high risk or key populations, but only 41% adult men reported using a condom at last higher risk sex. And uh, when we talk about HIV education and approach to sex education, only one fifth of men and women between ages 15 to 49 had comprehensive knowledge of HIV, right? Uh, so there are many things that we need to cover up on many fronts. Moving on, uh, we'll come to the case scenario through which we are going to discuss some of the changes in practice that would probably. So, uh, we had a 50 year old emaciated gentleman brought to us on 17th October at 5 a.m. in the ER in a drowsy state with a sudden onset of breathlessness after the patient was fed milk. As per his attendance, although the patient had been drowsy for the past three days, his sensorium had worsened from the past one day. Uh, vital showed marked tachycardia, uh, hypotension, tachypneic, initial saturations of 60% uh, on room air and uh, patient was febrile. So the ABG was suggestive of type one respiratory failure with severe metabolic lactic acidosis. Just to give you a brief background on this gentleman. So he was suffering from low mood and poor attention from almost six months and had poor oral intake for three months and generalized weakness for three months. Both were progressive in nature. And he also was having uh, several syncopal episodes for the past 15 days and uncontrollable hiccups. Few days prior to this admission, he developed uh, fever. So family history wise, he's married with uh, two children and uh, the elder uh, daughter is 11 years old, younger son, seven years old. The uh, sexual history could not be collected uh, because uh, the patient was in altered sensorium. A uh, previous prescription had labeled him a case of anorexia nervosa with depressive disorder. And we had a few scattered prescription from uh, multiple physicians and some blood workup which showed basically uh, anemia and low PLC count. And uh, his chest X-ray was something like this. Right, there were bilateral ill-defined opacities, no unremarkable hilar shadows. At the time when this patient came, we our hospital obviously uh, was completely filled with the cases of the pandemic, and this is what everyone would probably be thinking: COVID, COVID. So uh, basically, provisional diagnosis in ER stood at sari-like illness, possibility of aspira aspiration pneumonitis, sepsis with type one respiratory failure with severe metabolic lactic acidosis in shock, right? To summarize this case, so little did we know at that time that this gentleman is going to be with us in the hospital for little over one month and uh, substantial amount duration of that stay was spent in the ICU. And uh, we had um, counseled the wife and uh, taken her consent for the HIV testing. It, uh, which came in positive for HIV-1 substantially, was subsequently uh, the HIV RNA-PCR uh, copies and quantitative was sent and CD4 counts were found to be as low as 29. So why, is, why, why are we discussing this case in particular? So this was not a very usual case. He, there were multiple complications. This gentleman had anemia, thrombocytopenia, altered sensorium, Right, and uh, the patient was intubated and was in the ICU. So uh, 
we investigated we did bronchoscopy lavage we investigated and found only things that we found were candida uh, and uh, klebsiella pneumonia and we started on culture sensitive uh, sensitive antibiotics and uh, antifungals we uh, wanted to look for cmv possibility of cmv and due to cost issues the pcr couldn't be sent we just sent the igg which came in positive and after a lot of thought uh valgancyclovir was started as treatment so <clears throat> what happened was despite all of this uh, although the patient came out of a ventilator and we uh, you know the oxygen requirements were still there and the uh, chest shadows were not improving so uh, the workup for pcp all came in negative completely and uh, we all we thought of uh, uh, mac as well and nothing came up but after a lot of thought we finally initiated treatment for uh, tuberculosis including mac coverage so basically this gentleman uh, was discharged as a case of hiv wasting syndrome with bronchial candidiasis uh, sepsis with septic shock lrti uh, which is klebsiella with possible pcp and cmv infection and uh, we still were doubtful about pulmonary tb and mot that is uh, um, non tubercular mycobacteria so uh, discussing this case uh, there was involvement of so many specialties and uh, for what what exactly went wrong is is this the way uh, generally a uh, hiv case should come to us right so we have a few pertinent concerns over here did the primary care physician miss the bus really anorexia nervosa depressive disorder a 50 year old male uh, less likely uh, very less likely yet this diagnosis and there we could see uh, that the patient and attendants were hopping doctors because all prescriptions were for, from different doctors or or maybe the anorexia nervosa was a diagnosis of denial maybe the patient's consent was taken he was probably evaluated and uh, found to be hiv positive but he wasn't still ready for this diagnosis he was not agreeable to this diagnosis we'll hold that thought we'll discuss about it in detail the other concern is uh, are we looking at a patient centered holistic approach or or we just quenching diagnostic thirst when when we have to involve so many specialities and there is so much cost burden on the patient so <clears throat> i'll elaborate slightly on the kubler ross grief cycle here uh, so uh, this was a model that was studied by the scientist kubler ross and uh, she gave it for uh, terminal illnesses she had proposed that grieving generally progresses in five stages those being denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance so uh, there is a very specific pattern about grieving in hiv because till the time the patient is in a phase of denial or anger for that matter uh, the patient generally tends to grief in isolation right uh, unlike other terminal illnesses let's say for cancer because here the patient cannot disclose this diagnosis to the most close ones the most near and dear ones right and the, so that that is bad as a support system for the patient and uh, once the patient you know probably starts coming to the phase of bargain where he is overwhelmed help, still helpless and he is probably wanting another diagnosis please god why me why why this diagnosis and subsequently you know you want the patient to actually enter the phase of depression because that is the road towards acceptance because at bargaining level also these patients tend, tend to shoot out and they remain in denial or they don't accept their diagnosis and there is a risky behavior patient tend to uh, do drugs from habits right so coming towards acceptance is obviously the right course of action because the stigma associated with this disease is such and also the poor knowledge because still for majority population just just this diagnosis of hiv aids is is maybe a, they are faced with death it is for them like a death sentence because they are not aware right so 
when we discussed about holistic care uh, i think the best care uh, only healthcare providers who are offering a patient centered non judgmental care will manage to establish a smooth journey from uh, probably an effective diagnosis to appropriate psychological psychosocial support and then continuity of treatment right so let's go go through uh, these components of uh, the cycle so the first one being the team approach uh, towards the diagnosis so that doesn't mean involving all specialties from the word go and you know investigation uh, investigating like uh, in all directions it is basically that we need to involve uh, the psychologist and uh, physician together for to, to give a prepared uh, to get him prepared for effective therapy him or her for effective therapy now customization of our pharmacotherapy only with the right knowledge about the hiv infection to the patients that only comes when the doctor or the physician treating for per se first has the right amount of knowledge about it and the knowledge and understanding of pharmacokinetic and pharma pharmacodynamic aspects of therapy would the physician draw tailor made regime for her or his patient right the physician has to utilize existing supports be it a, a community support family support or spiritual or religious support right and only necessary referrals very very important that we only stick to necessary referrals because uh, you know uh, only if there are certain coexisting medical ailments that need to be taken care of beyond the treating physicians uh, you know uh, scope only then referral monitoring monitoring is not just monitoring of the lab parameters uh, it is also monitoring uh, how how is the patient taking the disease the mindset you know uh, because you we have to uh, catch hold of uh, you know certain uh, behavioral patterns because this is this is not a disease not, not taking anything away from the specialists who are doing great in our country but for example it's not this treatment is not like see treatment of ckd by a nephrologist you don't just start and diagnose ckd and then he as a patient knows he has to undergo dialysis and continues here the patient in between treatment you know might lose confidence may may uh, stop taking medications may not disclose it to you and that can cause all sort of problems so drug resistance could be there and you know uh, you don't get the right kind of uh, viral load suppression and coming to life goal setting that is that is very important by that is why we are emphasizing that uh, hiv primary care you know the primary care physician has an important role because uh, life goal setting is not something that you could probably get at a, a multi specialty hospital taking care of your treatment you know you have to know the patient being a family physician have a great rapport with the patient and only then you can you know set uh, effective uh, therapy and discuss with him or her for realistic goals for her or his life tell them about u is equal to u as has been highlighted by my previous speaker and that might be very liberating for the patient right so as a family physician our uh, goals should be i think the five c's at the heart of uh, family practice uh, contextual comprehensive continuous coordinated and first contact care and in addition obviously wherever possible uh, because no matter uh, how rich our country continues to get we are always a resource poor nation in terms of medical uh, facilities so cost effective care you know and uh, i would like to uh, quote dr devi shetty from his tedx talk over here that a solution that is not cost effective especially in our country is not a solution at all right so uh, some take home points national and global initiatives for hiv care lot is being done but not enough has been utilized yet more family physicians trained in the art of hiv medicine and with the awareness of emerging drug resistance are needed in primary care setting patient centered non judgmental holistic care remains the essence of approaching a person with hiv and uh, probably long back things were sensed by uh, 
this great physician and teacher sir robert hutchison and i would like to quote him over here from putting knowledge before wisdom science before art and cleverness before common sense from treating patients as cases and from making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same good lord deliver us on a lighter note here is hiv in india and this is your friendly neighborhood family physician trying to hold on to where we have reached and trying to pull in what has been uh, unreached so far uh, i would like to thanks spice root and afpi for this opportunity dr seema dhir ma'am a uh, senior consultant at my hospital uh, under whom the patient was admitted dr arpit jain senior consultant at my hospital uh, in internal medicine and hiv medicine uh, dr arpit prasad who has mentored me through this presentation without his support this wouldn't have been possible dr pranith i do not frankly have words to describe at what orders he has helped me out with this presentation dr jyotika secretary spice root uh, immensely thankful for this opportunity my uh, dear colleagues dr anadi prakash mishra dr divya uh, dr tamal hazra and dr neeraj kumar who have been um, you know uh, taking care of all my irritability and tantrums and uh, two of my friends pavan preet kaur dio and deren uh, dhanya merin thomas who uh, have provided timely creative distractions when i was uh, uh, getting irritable thank you so much and uh, i would take any questions or if uh, if the time permits or maybe we can have them in the chat box as suggested right thank you very much thank you very much vidyut uh, for that interesting presentation i think i really loved that uh, especially uh, the note uh, you made about the holistic care so thank you very much for that and also for enlightening us about the status of hiv and the management plans in india and also a special thank goes to i think dr rk for mentoring him so thanks thank you very much thank you thank so you so that, much thank you so much thanks vidyut so we are we are moving on to the next uh, talk our next speaker dr aruni veerakorn de silva is a board certified specialist and a senior lecturer in family medicine in the faculty of medical sciences university of sri jawadanapura sri lanka aruni is the national secretary of the spice root movement as well uh and uh, interestingly Aruni has a postgraduate diploma in venereology, which made us to select her unanimously as the best speaker to talk to you on this topic. Aruni, over to you uh, to talk to us on HIV infection, the role of the general practitioner. Yes, sir. You are ready to go. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes, we can Fine. see. Got it. Right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, since we are a little bit behind time, uh, I would like to go through, take a quick go through uh, in my slides. And just in the start, I would like to take three points from the three speakers. Uh, the first from Manjula. Manjula highlighted that uh, the HIV infection is diagnosed late. More than 50% is diagnosed at a late stage. And from the second speaker, the marvelous opportunities that we have uh, the medication for prevention and uh, prevention of transmission and also uh, for the treatment making, I mean, the life expectancy near normal and also uh, providing the opportunity for the people living with HIV to lead a near normal life. And then from the third speaker, the primary care missing the bus. So keeping all these three 
points in mind, let's go through what our role should be in the management of and uh, combating this epi HIV epidemic. So I would like to focus on five areas uh, where a GP can play an important role. The first is the increasing awareness in, among our patients. Next, promoting safe sex. And the most important of, out of all, that is HIV testing, because by now you must have understood that testing is the key to fight this epidemic, because we have such wonderful options for prevention and ma management of HIV. Then comes the prevention and guide opportunities the management after occupational exposure. This, of course, since there have been multiple questions on the chat group, I have posted to the chat uh, the relevant information, so I would cut time on that. Then the most important is to support the people living with HIV and their families. Right. So coming into the GP role, the, the most important is to detect the high-risk populations that we are dealing with. So most of you all know the sex workers, the men having sex with men, and then the patients who have multiple sex partners, tourist industry workers, migrant workers, prisoners, drug users, victims of sexual violence, internally displaced populations, war victims, and patients with STIs, TB, hepatitis B, C, and this is a summary of the high-risk populations where we should target our health education and screening. So when we say uh, about identifying our high-risk populations, the most important is the sexual history. Most of the time, we feel a bit backward in uh, stepping into the sexual history, especially when, the, when we are having a good uh, doctor-patient relationship with our patients and we have been knowing the patient for a long time and even the family, we feel a bit reluctant to ask the sexual history. So what are we going to ask? We have to ask about the Koitake, that's the first sexual exposure when it happened and the age at Koitake. Then the type of sexual act. So uh, can you remember what is said about the MSMs, the men having sex of uh, with men that these MSMs are the population who drives the epidemic in most of the world. So the receptive anal intercourse is associated with the highest incidence of HIV infection followed by insertive anal intercourse and receptive vaginal intercourse. So then we have to ask whether the act was protected or unprotected, that is whether they use condoms appropriately and also a uh, few details about the partner, whether it is the marital, the stable, or the casual partner, their occupation, and also about their risk behaviors. And we have to take a detailed history about the last sexual act, the partner details, when did it occur, the type of act, and whether it was protected or unprotected. Why do we need such detailed sexual history? Sexual history is a way of assessing the risk of acquiring HIV. Then it helps to tailor-made the health education and counseling based on their high-risk behaviors. And also it helps us to manage and time the screening test. And also it helps to interpret the reports. And also it gives us an opportunity to encourage partner screening. Right, so promoting safe sex. I think all uh, GP, as G primary care doctors, we know we have to find time for opportunistic health promotion and prevention. So once we come across high-risk population, it is wise to grab the opportunity to educate them on HIV and how to prevent. And also all primary care doctors should be competent and confident and should not be reluctant in promoting condoms. And also they should be feel very confident in demonstrating how to use condoms and so on, because it is a key skill that is necessary to protect yourself from HIV. Right, so as emphasized early, 
the global target is to screen, 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 and detect HIV people at a very early stage. So screening is one major area where the general practitioners can play a major role to help and to take responsibility in fighting against HIV. So my next few slides are based on the National HIV Testing Guidelines of Sri Lanka. Uh, so HIV screening is based on five principles or the five Cs. That is counseling where we give the necessary information before doing the test, the pre-test information, then ensuring our patients about the confidentiality, obtaining consent before the testing, and ensuring correct results. That is, as doctors, we have a responsibility to ensure that our testing is done in a trustable laboratory and adhering to quality assurance mechanisms. The final C stands for connect to care. After testing, whether it is negative or positive, based on the patient's risky behaviors, we have to connect our patients with other resources, the STD control programs, the STD clinics, and so on, to support them, to uh, protect themselves from HIV, and for the positives to get the proper treatment. So in most of the countries, the, the recommendations on testing varies. So based on the prevalence of HIV and the available resources. In some countries, it is recommended that you give uh, suggest testing with minimum information and give the opportunity for the patient to opt out. And uh, written consent is not required for HIV testing. Uh, verbal consent is more than enough. So what is available as screening test? We have the fourth generation test, which combines HIV antibody and the antigen. So uh, narrowing down the window period to two to three weeks. And also we have the rapid test, which is, utilizes again, checking for the antibody as well as the antigen, which can be like the results can be available in a very short time, like 20 to 30 minutes. And it could be done at point of care and even in the field, making HIV testing more acceptable and available. Uh, if the screening is positive, it is followed by confirmatory test done on a different sample using uh, immunoassay, the Western blot or the molecule assays. Uh, and at the moment in our country, in Sri Lanka, the confirmatory test is available only at the National Reference Lab. Uh, not on, a screening is not on, not a just one go process, especially if there is an ongoing risk for HIV. So we have to consider uh, repeat testing. And also based on the last exposure, we might have to repeat the test considering the window period. If the patient is within the window period, we need to have, we need to repeat the HIV test uh, in six weeks and maybe even in three months in rare occasions if we have strong doubts. Right, so what are the strategies of testing? We have client-initiated testing, that is a patient who is aware of HIV and have a self-evaluation of the possibility of having HIV stepping into a doctor and asking for the test. So this is an opportunity that we should not miss. So we should be able to uh, cater these patients by at, at least drawing the blood and sending it to a relevant laboratory, or of course, if we do have the rapid test in our clinics, uh, we can provide our patients with the rapid testing and giving their results within one hour or so. And there will be a video at the end of the session demonstrating how to do the rapid testing. Then comes the provider-initiated testing. So a provider-initiated is the doctor decides, okay, this patient needs it, I wish, testing. So it is routinely done for all pregnant mothers, all patients with TBs, all patients with STIs, all patients with hepatitis B and C, and also for healthcare workers who have accidental exposures and also for drug dependency programs. Right, then comes the people who we decide whether we are going to offer testing based on their risky behaviors. So uh, family, uh, members, siblings of people with HIV infection and uh, 
patients who are suspected of having primary HIV infection and other HIV indicator conditions, which will be uh, dealt a little bit later. And also men having sex with men, the female sex workers, beach boys, prison inmates, and also the youth. And also migrant workers, tourism, uh, tourist workers, and also persons with multiple sex partners. So uh, not only the AIDS defining illnesses, there are other conditions which we might uh, encounter in our general practices like bacterial pneumonia, dementia, severe seborrheic dermatitis, oral candidiasis, chronic diarrhea, unexplained weight loss, and unexplained blood dyscrasias, um, generalized lymphadenopathy. All these conditions we might come across in our day-to-day -day practice, and we should not wait as our last resort and to exclude all the other conditions we have to consider to offer HIV testing in these patients. Right, and supporting the people living with HIV, uh, they go through a lot of suffering and we have to think of psychological support and supporting the family as well. As doctors, we have to know, we have to appreciate that they are people with human rights. So we have to act to reduce stigma and prevent discrimination. And we have to be non-judgmental, especially when we are dealing, dealing with these marginalized populations like men having sex with men and the sex workers and so on. Uh, coming to the last bit of the presentation, counseling for HIV testing, like I mentioned, we have to give the minimum information and get the consent. So if we are having the time uh, to give up, do a pre-test counseling, we should educate them about HIV AIDS and the improved outcome nowadays with the modern medication, the natural history has become much more acceptable and transmission can be nullified by the available treatment. And so highlighting the benefits of diagnosis and also highlighting the availability of the services for the patients. We can encourage them to take up the test and also guarantee confidentiality. And if the test is negative, if the risk is ongoing, we still have to link our patients with other resources like the STD clinics. And if they are positive, we have to explain them what is, what is the meaning of being positive and the follow-up are needed for the confirmatory testing and linking with the, them with the treatment services and so on. And also we have to find out soon after giving this bad news, we had to find out how they are coping with the results at that moment and make sure they have a safe journey home and make sure that they have a lot of support during the very early phase where they are going to be stressed out and frustrated about their new issue. So next we have a very short video explaining the rapid test and over to Dr. Supoon, can you uh, play the video please? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, can you uh, put stop share? Okay, sure. Right. There are different types of HIV rapid test kits are available in Sri Lanka. It could be either HIV antigen and antibody test or antibodies only test. It may be HIV 1 and 2 antibody test. Today we use HIV antigen and antibody combo rapid test. First you take the rapid HIV test strip. If you are performing more than one at a time, we need to label them with the number and the time of the test. We need to clean the skin using a soap with antiseptic. Then prick the finger using a sterile lancet. Squeeze the finger and collect the blood into a capillary tube at least one centimeter color. Then 
blood transfer to the rapid HIV test strip. Next, you add the buffer solution. How do we interpret the results? Check the strip after exactly 20 minutes. This is the control band and this is the antigen line and antibody lines. If the control band is not available, test is invalid. If a control band is present but no other band is there, test is negative. If all three bands are positive, consider as positive. Either antigen band or antibody band with control band is considered as a positive. You can see this patient's strip has only control band, therefore it is negative. Lancet, capillary tube and test strips need to be dis disposed into a sharp bin. Over to you, sir. Right, Aruni, I have a special request from Dr. Uh, Ramakrishna Prasad. I think he's okay. here. He's here. I think, uh, see whether he's, I think he's there. Um, Dr. Ramakrishna Prasad is a specialist in primary care, uh, uh, you know, uh, sexual health. So, uh, I'm really happy if we can uh, have him with us and uh, if he can speak a few words uh, because he's a very good resource. I met him at Bangalore and he's a very nice man as well. So, Dr. R.K., over to you. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Sankar, uh, really my privilege to be part of this. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Aruni, as well. This video that you showed is so empowering. You know, in two, two and a half minutes, you, you've shown the entire procedure of how some someone in their own practice can do um, point of care testing. Uh, first of all, this has been a session. Um, I think central point here, uh, at least from my perspective, is that uh, we as family physicians <clears throat> must not forget that we are here to treat patients. We are here to treat people and their families in a non-judgmental, holistic manner, as Dr. Bidyuth had uh, uh, showcased with the patient-centered non-judgmental model. I think this uh, session is also very timely and um, um, we're living um, at a time where two things are happening. One, very positive in the HIV world and one, something we need to guard against. <clears throat> what is positive is we have a whole array of solutions and definitely the um, incidence is going down. HIV is no longer the death sentence as it used to be, even a decade back. Um, HIV is a chronic disease. And I, I, in fact, tell my patients when they first get diagnosed that, you know, with treatment and if they work only with, a, uh, if we work closely with uh, together, then they can hope to live just as long and just as well um, as they might as uh, might have hoped to live without infection. So these are very positive developments. We have medications, even, even I, when I was a fellow, <clears throat> and just before that, a decade, 10, 15 years back, we used to treat HIV with a handful of pills. Today, most people require one pill once a day, and they do exceptionally well. But what we need to guard against is there is increasing complacency as well. Many, many times there is, uh, uh, there is an imagination, especially among uh, professionals, that HIV is now a problem which has been solved. And uh, this complacency is something we need to guard against. So thank you for this opportunity to speak and really my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Dr. Ran, uh, Dr. Prasad. I think it's very enlightening and it's a very wonderful message to wrap up the session. And since we are running behind time, we would like to take one question. 
from the audience. Uh, Dr. Sukuni, do you find any important unanswered questions that we can put into uh, to our panelists? Uh, no, I think all the questions were answered. I will uh, just share. Uh, I just uh, took the questions into a Word document and the question is in black and the answer is in blue. So the last question uh, which was answered is uh, some consultants request HIV test status before surgical procedures routinely. Is this allowed? Uh, Dr. Indika Karunathilaka has asked this question. Uh, I think it's directed to you, uh, Dr. Aruni. Uh, I think we'll, uh, shall we put this question to Dr. Manjula? Manjula will yeah. be able to, are you with us, Manjula? Yes, yes she's with us. Uh, yes, Aruni. So, uh, some so it has to be with the patient's consent so we know routinely uh, the cardiologists before the cabgs they routinely uh, request the hiv test not only the hiv actually all the blood borne diseases hepatitis b c as well as hiv they request some gynecologists they request before the major surgery so that's up to them to decide but uh, it's it's not the mandatory testing because they can't uh, refuse to perform the surgical procedure if the patient does not uh, like to get the get the test done so it's not a mandatory with the patient consent actually you can always do it and uh, we give the report okay thank you very much manjula for that uh, very clear straightforward answer for the question and now let me uh, uh, conclude this session by thanking our valuable resource persons Thank you very much, Manjula. Thank you very much, Mahesh, all over from Australia. I know it's your very much, uh, part, you have passed your bedtime and you are remaining with us. Thank you very much for your sharing your expertise. And also thank you, uh, our uh, resource persons from India for sharing their uh, expertise and time with us. And also I would like to take this opportunity to Thank uh, Dr. Vino Dharma, uh, Dharma Kulasinghe, uh, who is consultant venerologist at Panadura Base Hospital for preparing the video for us on rapid HIV testing. And also Mr. Hasanka Mendis, who is, the, who is a health attendant of Panadura Base Hospital uh, for videography and editing the video. And also a big thank you for Harris, the CEO Wonka for facilitating this event and um, giving the technical support. And of course, all my colleagues uh, from Spice Root South Asia, the leads of uh, South Asia Spice Root and the regional um, council for the encouragement to make this event and success. And at last, but not least, I would like to thank all the participants for their enthusiastic participation. A very big thank you. And uh, please join us with our future CPD programs. Thank you very much and a very good night. Thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Aruni.